Hello everyone, the instant camera guy here. This is going to be the first video in what will likely become a series of deep dives into the current range of Impossible Projects slash Polaroid Originals cameras. Uh, and mainly the issue with the battery that these cameras use. Ever since the very first Instant Lab was released around 2013, each camera that either Impossible Project, who are now Polaroid Originals, each camera that they've released to take iType film has used a built-in rechargeable lithium-ion design. And this video series, my aim is really to explore the problems with doing such a design and to explore how, how non-user friendly it is when it comes to replacing such a battery. Now, before I even continue this video series, I just want everyone watching to have a big deep breath and think about what it is that I'm saying with a critical mind, because it seems that each time I do a video or a rant or a topic or a post on this subject, I get met with a lot of uh, prickly comments. <laughs> um, anything from accusations that I'm simply complaining about modern iType cameras because somehow they affect my main business, which is restoring classic Polaroid cameras. Um, that isn't true. I benefit from fixing these <laughs> because I'm one of the few technicians that will actually offer uh, battery replacements on iType cameras. So no, it's it's not about that. I, I actually make money off these. So technically it would advantage me to not talk about this topic. Um, and I want to just really emphasize that, uh, you know, you can love a company and still be critical of their products. I absolutely love Polaroid slash Impossible Project slash Classic Polaroid to death. Otherwise, I wouldn't be doing what I do. I've dedicated the better part of my spare time for over a decade to figuring out everything that makes these cameras tick and finding ways to keep them alive for as long as possible. Um, but it irritates me when these modern cameras have a battery that is prone to dying within a few years. Um, so ever since the Instant Lab, as I said, which was released at around 2013, followed by the Impossible i1, which was then followed by their uh, sort of box type cameras, the One Step, One Step Plus, and, and the Now, uh, and even their modern flagship camera, the Polaroid i2, they all contain the same type of design of battery, which is a little pouch cell uh, soft pack lithium ion battery, generally 3.7 volts. Sometimes these batteries are doubled up, such as in the case of the Instant Lab. Other times they're doubled up to, uh, sometimes they're doubled up to double the voltage. Sometimes they're doubled up to increase the milliamp hours. But regardless of whatever battery these cameras are using, one thing remains fairly constant, and that is that these batteries do have a finite shelf life. My experience from clients complaining to me about them no longer holding charge suggests that battery failure can happen in as little as a year, but typically around five years, the batteries are really starting to go south. And the issue with such a design is hiding the battery inside the camera whilst, yes, I agree, will make the form factor slightly smaller, does make it a lot harder to service. Even for a technician such as myself, I find it somewhat irritating to service these cameras because of how unnecessarily difficult it is to get replacements. Um, and so I want to really just dive deep inside this issue and make some of my points on the topic clear. I want people watching in the comment section to refrain from using straw man arguments, uh, which is basically like, um, you know, for example, my argument is the batteries that are in these things should be user replaceable. Just like pretty much any modern device, you know, like my, my Canon DSLR here has a user swappable battery. This is my argument that batteries in a Polaroid, because there's a lot of different off the shelf designs that Polaroid could have chosen or Impossible Project could have chosen. My argument here is that the battery should be user replaceable because it's a good way to improve the longevity of the life of the camera. Because in the current state, when the batteries go bad, people 
unless they're incredibly handy with a soldering iron, are forced to find a technician who can replace it, which adds substantial cost to repair, and since these are pretty cheap cameras to begin with, a lot of people just end up buying a new camera, or simply throwing the old one away. So my argument is the batteries should be user replaceable. And as I said, each time I try and make this comment, I met with, for some reason, people just straight up simping for Polaroid, um, offering up all kinds of straw man arguments that, uh, you know, for example, well, it doesn't matter because a technician such as yourself can replace them. That, well, that might be true, but that's not my argument. <laughs> my argument is I shouldn't need to, it should be user replaceable. And then someone will counter and say, oh, well, you know, replacing a battery is too hard for the average consumer. To which I'll say, again, that's, that's not the point I'm trying to make. And also, like, if you possess the ability to insert a pack of film, you can probably replace a battery, you know what I'm trying to say? Um, and then, like, I get other straw man arguments, like, oh, it's because these things are designed for children. Um, or can often be given to children, and, I don't know, a child might eat the lithium-ion battery somehow. I don't know what ridiculous situations people come up with in their heads. Um, again, if that was really the case and you wanted to protect it from children, you would do the same thing that manufacturers do with toys, and that's just simply bury the battery behind a little compartment where you need a screwdriver to access it. Just a single little Phillips head screw makes it childproof. So I want you guys to watch the video understand the point that I'm trying to make, which is that I'm not trying to shit on Polaroid as a company, I'm not trying to say they have nefarious intent here, I'm not trying to say their products are bad, their cameras are bad, I, I'm not saying any of that. This entire video series is about the problems that come from built-in, non-user replaceable lithium-ion batteries, and my argument is Polaroid needs to do better. They need to redesign their cameras to use user-replaceable batteries because in their current state, many consumers are simply throwing away their models when, they're, when they no longer hold charge or are being forced to buy a new one. And in the short term, that might be nice for increasing profits and selling more cameras, but in the long term, you end up burning a whole bunch of consumers that suddenly see your cameras as disposable junk. So that is really the point that I'm trying to make here. Again, I felt like I had to do this introduction because each time I try and give well thought out and constructive criticism on this issue, for some reason, a small minority of people see it as a personal attack. <laughs> and I'm not sure if it's just because they own these iType cameras and somehow think I'm insulting them, but I really want to make that clear. So, with that video introduction out of the way, I'd like to get on with the main topic of the video, which was uh, refurbishing an instant lab-based film processor back that a client of mine, Sam, sent me. Uh, it was modified by Reservot for use with a Mamiya RB67, and it no longer held a charge. So, Enjoy my teardown, enjoy my commentary, and in the video at several points I ask for viewer help. Uh, if you have uh, information that would help me in terms of this subject, or help improve finding replacement batteries, please let me know, because it is, it is my mission as of 2024 to find replacement batteries for every single one of Polaroid's current i-type range of cameras, so that I, as a technician, can keep them alive. Enjoy the show. Hello everyone, the Instant Camera Guy here, and welcome to what is a slightly more unusual Polaroid repair video. Here we have a Impossible Project Instant Lab which has been converted for use with a Mamiya Press or the Polaroid 600 SE. I'm not entirely sure. And this was sent to me by a client of mine named Sam. And the reason that he sent this back to me is that it no longer works. The battery, which is inside the door, I believe, that ejects the film, no longer holds a charge. And so it's going to be my job to take this thing apart, 
see exactly where that battery is, what kind it takes, and replace it. And so uh, this is a topic of video I've been meaning to do for a long time, and it's a topic that I want to talk about deeper in future videos, but it's really problematic with modern Polaroid cameras. And basically what I'm talking about is the use of built-in lithium-ion rechargeable batteries. Um, effectively, all modern i-type cameras that have been produced by either Impossible Project or now Polaroid, Polaroid Originals, at least until the time of me posting this video, have all used some variation of a built-in rechargeable lithium-ion battery, which is not user-replaceable. These are batteries that are effectively baked in somewhere in the camera, uh, whether it's in the door or in the body of the camera, and are basically at a point where the general public just can't access that battery to replace it when it dies. And this is a big problem because it effectively gives the product a shelf life of somewhere between three to six years. That is my, uh, that is my experience with these things, is that after about three to six years or so, they just stop holding a charge. And the reason for that is lithium ion batteries do have quite a long shelf life, right? For example, if you think about a, a mobile phone, they can last years and years before battery performance starts to die down. But Polaroid cameras have a lot of current draw because of their DC motors. A DC motor, when it spins at fast RPM, and a lot of these motors spin at a roughly 10,000 RPM, it puts a very high drain on the battery, which reduces its shelf life comparative to, let's say, you know, it was running some LED lights or something like that with a relatively low current draw. So basically that means that if you use the camera fairly regularly, it's pretty much guaranteed to be bricked <laughs> within anywhere from... I've heard clients of mine have problems in as little as one year, uh, but generally around that sort of three to five year mark, they start to go south. So one of my New Year's resolutions as of 2024 is to figure out ways to replace the batteries in every single i-type camera. Because Polaroid do not offer this as a service, at least at the time of me releasing this video. If you contact Polaroid Originals or Polaroid Australia or something like that, they will not replace your battery unless the camera is under warranty, and it's my understanding then that they simply just replace the camera. So uh, effectively, what that means is you end up with a paperweight, unless you wanna dismantle it yourself or send it to a technician who can replace it for you. And my experience is a lot of clients that end up with these end up just simply buying another camera or throwing away their old one, and that's a problem. It's incredibly wasteful. And I'm not suggesting here that Polaroid has some kind of malicious intent, but you could argue that building in the lithium-ion battery is a form of planned obsolescence. And planned obsolescence is uh, basically a thought process that suggests that if you make your pro products obsolete after you know, X amount of years, then you'll be able to sell more products. So really what I want to do in this particular video is take this thing apart, see what kind of battery it takes, and then I'm going to go online and order some, and once they arrive in a few days or a few weeks, however long it takes, I will um, uh, basically report back and, and see if I can cludge something together. Um, but yeah, this is, a, this is a big problem in terms of this design. And before I go any further, I would like to say that I made this criticism when the Polaroid i2 was released. That is, they're uh, very expensive. As of this video, they're, they're current generation flagship camera. It's worth about 1,100 Australian dollars, or about 700 US dollars. And that camera has the same issue. It uses a built-in rechargeable lithium-ion battery. And in my opinion, it's just not acceptable these days. Um, when I voiced my criticism about the i2, I was met with a lot of comments, um, seemingly from people that already owned the i2, uh, and they had, effectively they were like trying to, and I don't understand why, but they were trying to like come up with excuses for companies 
as to why they have to make batteries built in. And one person suggested that it was because it makes like the product easy to use and like that people would find it too difficult to replace batteries. Which is just like, that's just total nonsense. <laughs> Lithium ion batteries are not new technology. It's been around since the nineties. Um, and cameras back then, here, let me pause for a second. I'll go grab one. Like this is a Sony Mavica from 1997. And it, it's got a built-in, user-replaceable lithium battery. It's in a little cell, and if it drains or if it dies and you're in the field, you can just take it out and insert another one, right? It's user-replaceable. Like, the, are they trying to suggest that we no longer possess the skills to do this? Because I'd argue if you can insert a pack of film, then you pretty much have the same set of motor skills to put a battery in a camera. And there's really no excuse that you can't just put a little battery door somewhere to allow easy access. It doesn't necessarily need to have a switch, right? You could bury that door behind a little screw or something like that. Because one of the other arguments I got was, oh, well, Polaroid cameras tend to be marketed for children and, uh, you know, so you shouldn't make the battery user replaceable. Well, a lot of toys have batteries built into them too. And the standard protocol is just to use a little Phillips head screw on the battery door instead of a switch. So really, I don't buy any excuse for the built-in batteries other than, you know, maybe they want to make the design a bit more sleek or something like that. But I would really argue it's a plan. It's a form of planned obsolescence, nothing more, nothing less. And, Probably by design. I mean, possibly by design. Like I said, I'm, I'm not going to sit here and say that there's some cloak and daggers room of nefarious shareholders going, ah, yes, if we put the rechargeable battery in there, we'll sell 10,000 more units every five years. I'm not saying that that's going on, right? But what I'm saying is it's very frustrating that people that brought this technology can't use it years later down the track because the batteries aren't replaceable. All right. Now, I have taken apart an Instant Lab before. I actually modified one to fit onto a 4x5 graph lock back once as a one-off custom project just to see if I could. Um, so, as far as I remember, the battery that runs the camera is built into the door. And from memory, the door is held in place by these two screws. Um, one thing I did like about a lot of the modern Polaroid cameras, all the screws that hold it together are exactly the same. So you don't need to kind of remember which screw came from where. And from what I remember, the battery in this camera sits next to the motor. So I'm gonna see how this comes apart. It has been years since I worked on one of these. And part of the reason that I don't work on these very often is whenever I have spoken to people that have owned one of these, the cost of getting a replacement battery has just always put people off. All right. Okay. So we have a little 7.4 volt uh, lithium polymer battery rated at about 300 milliamps. And it looks like that that is just connected via like a little JST connector into the camera's little circuit board here. So I'm just gonna see if I can, there we go, get that out. All right, well, that was relatively easy. Now, from what I can see, these are actually two batteries packed together. So I'm gonna see if I can just undo some of the tape here just to reveal exactly what's going on. And I'll obviously have to make up my own battery pack once the new one comes in. But I'm gonna suggest that these are probably wired in a series so that the like milliamp hours are doubled, probably because of the, the thin shape of the battery. They wanted to get extra power out of it. So let's see here. Yeah, I believe that's the case. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right, well, I'm gonna hop on eBay and see what I can find. Well, 
interesting findings. This particular battery is actually two battery cells that are combined through use of a little PCB and some chips, which obviously act to combine the voltages of both little lithium ion cells and create a single output. That's how you're able to get uh, 7.4 volts, because each of these little pouches of lithium ion cell will output about 3.7, so the combination of the two outputs 7.4. Um, according to this, it does say 300 milliamp hours, uh, which yeah is is in line. the The input here is 9.5 at 500 milliamp hours, so that would make sense. So it's a little 300 milliamp hour battery. Um, but what's interesting is these actual battery cells still work. They still hold a charge. It's actually the bridge chip that has failed. So. If I get my multimeter out on DC voltage and I go on the terminals to each individual cell, we can see 3.4 and yeah, 3.5. So these cells still hold a charge. However, when I try and get a reading off the center output, which should be about 7.5, that's when we're reading zero millivolts. So I would say that one of the little integrated circuits here, one of the little chips here has very likely blown, and that's what has rendered this camera obsolete. Now, either way, the, uh, the way that we're gonna rectify it here is by replacing the battery because it's not exactly that this has stopped holding a charge, it's that the battery has stopped working because the little bridging chip has failed. Um, so either way, we need to source a replacement. Now, I've managed to find two that I think will fit. The main problem I'm finding with a lot of these Polaroid batteries is Polaroids seem to use very strange size of batteries. That is like, it's like they go to the manufacturer and say, right, what's the closest drop-in replacement? And let's make ours just that little bit smaller. So it's hard to find one off the shelf that fits. Um, this, this battery measures approximately uh, sort of 36 millimeters in length. And I've managed to find a whole bunch of batteries that seem to be a pretty similar physical size, except most of them are slightly longer. So they're about 40 mil, 42 mil, which, I think should fit in the space that's down here, but it's gonna be a real squeeze to try and fit anything in. I mean, there is barely enough room as it is for this battery, um, let alone finding one that's, you know, sort of too long. So the width and the height, all the batteries that I can find are pretty similar, um, but it's finding one that's the right length that'll prove quite tricky, I believe, so. Um, Worst case scenario, I can always get one of these new batteries and swap the board over, but then I'm gonna be left with these old cells, which is not an ideal solution. So back to eBay, back to online search as I go, and hopefully I can find something that works. All right, well, it has been several days since I did an update on the uh, Polaroid Instant Lab um, film processor back that my client has sent me. As I said, this was a, a film processor back designed for either the 600 SE or the Mamiya Universal, maybe the RZ67. I actually don't know what this goes on. All I know is that it processes the film and was made uh, out of an old Instant Lab. Um, and where we left off was me trying to source replacement batteries uh, because the proprietary ones that were in there was outputting no voltage. And one of the things that I discovered was the cells are actually fine. The battery cells themselves, it's made up of two 300 milliamp 3.7 volts, which go into a balancing board. And then that outputs 300 milliamps at 7.4 volts. The problem is, the cells are fine, it's actually the board that has died. Now the problem there in the board dying is if we unfold the two halves of the battery, 
We've got a few little chips, a few resistors, a few capacitors. And basically what this part does is make sure that any voltage coming into the batteries is evenly distributed on either side so that they're always being charged at 3.7 volts each. Now I can easily find the cells online. I can find replacements for that very simply. But this board is proving incredibly troublesome. And that's the disadvantage with this rechargeable lithium ion technology is if any of the small charging circuit dies, you need to not only replace the battery, but you have to find a replacement for this as well. And that's what I'm finding so frustrating here. Now, there's a guy online who's put together a guide with how to build batteries for the Instant Labs. And effectively, he just takes two individual cells, wires them in a series, and calls it a day. But there's no balancing chip. The problem I have with that is that balancing chip is there for a reason. It's there to prevent overcharging, uneven cell distribution, and ultimately things like premature wear and tear, and even the potential for heat and fire. Now, I doubt that such a small battery in such an application would ever get to that stage, but without that balancing board, I'm pretty stuck in terms of what I can do with this Instant Lab because the only boards that I could find on eBay were huge, like four centimeters long, basically as big as the battery. So the only solutions that I have here are to try and use a, a loop, a magnifying loop, and try and find markings on these tiny little integrated circuits, these teeny tiny integrated circuits, and try and find a replacement there. Or abandon this type of battery altogether, chuck it in the bin, and that's exactly what I've gone for. This being a film processing unit, um, which which had this big, um, big, plastic chunk on the back that housed the circuitry that automatically shut off the motor. This doesn't need smart electronics. This just literally needs power to go to a motor to eject film. That is it. So what I've decided to do is the KISS principle, which is keep it simple stupid. <laughs> and I've just decided to completely get rid of all electronic parts other than the motor and just hardwire it direct into six volts powered by AAA batteries. Now, I have my little Kratax 1.5 volt butt converted uh, lithium ion batteries. So these are very good AAA batteries. I've spoken about them before on this channel. These are rechargeable. Uh, they come with a little USB-C um, USB powered charging station. And basically I've just stuck a, a, a six volt four AAA battery back on the rear of the film door, because this is going to be attached to a camera like so. Uh, and it takes up actually less room than the original giant chunk of plastic did that was sort of sitting there on the back like so, housing all the electronics. And the only thing that I have left to do now is just wire in a switch like to this negative battery lead. And I'm gonna try and come up with some kind of a bracket or, or just something to stick on here, to screw on here, just to give a little push button switch that's pretty much just gonna cut power. So it'll likely be mounted down here. So you'll just have to hold the button in until the film ejects. And so just to simulate what that's gonna be like, all you have to do, all I've gotta do is just attach the black wire to the negative lead, but you guys can hear. It works. And that's really all it needs to be. All of that extra charging circuit and that kind of stuff, I've just gotten rid of it. This really as a film processing back, simply just needs to be as simple as possible. And my client, Sam, I'm sure is gonna appreciate being able to just swap these out in the field. So that's pretty much where I'm gonna leave this project. Um, I, I will try and come back with the finished result. I've gotta to go to my local electronic store and see if I can come up with a little switch that I can add in there. But really, it's gonna be as simple as that. So to keep things simple, I ended up doing this. A button, a AAA battery pack, and that is it. There is no other electronics in this thing whatsoever. Effectively, what I've done is just hardwired directly into the motor there, a positive and a negative, which go 
into the battery back through a little kill switch. So uh, if we're orienting the camera uh, towards the front where the film ejects, that is turned on. If we flick it towards the back, that is turned off. So if you have the button turned on, simply hitting the red button is gonna eject the film. And all you have to do, there's no timer circuits, there's nothing. All you have to do is hold the red button until the film comes out. And that is it. Simple as that. So basically what this does is just send in the six volts from the four AAA batteries directly into the motor through use of a momentary switch. That is it. It is as simple as you can get it. Now, the benefit with a system like this is it's very unlikely to break. There's no integrated circuits, there's no capacitors, there's no resistors. It is just a button and a battery pack. The AAA batteries I'm using in this are actually rechargeable. I've spoken about these before. These are amazing batteries and I highly recommend you all pick some up. I'm not sponsored or anything like that. I just really like them. They buy a band called, a band. Yeah, check out my favorite band. <laughs> They're from a brand called Kratax, which kind of sounds like a thrash metal band, doesn't it? Um, yeah, they buy a brand called Kratax and they are USB-C rechargeable. So these are effectively lithium ion batteries, 3.7 volts, but with a tiny built-in buck converter that reduces it down to 1.5. So these effectively work like standard AAA batteries, but when you need, when they're flat, you just recharge them. These are one of the most life-changing things I've ever purchased for myself. It is so awesome to not have to constantly go to the store to buy AAA batteries. Um, but obviously the advantage to using a AAA design like this is it's very standard. You can just go to the store and get them. Um, if you run out in the field, even a local gas station will have AAA batteries. They're a standardized design. They come in rechargeable formats, or you could just use disposable alkaline if you're really in a pinch. So that's basically what we ended up deciding to do for this camera. And because it, because it mounts to the rear of something, um, the shape of it doesn't really matter. I mean, this thing, when I first got it, had this big, big wart on the back of it sitting around here, uh, which housed the original electronics, all the, all the timer circuit and stuff that would time the motor and how long it ejects. I simply got rid of all that. It's actually slimmer than the original back was, despite the AAA battery holder. Um, and yeah, that's, that's basically what I ended up deciding to do. Now, obviously on an instant lab, it's now gonna sit at an angle if it was the, the true instant lab, not this adapted version that's been turned into a film processing unit. Um, but even then, I would say, you know, all I'd have to do is attach some little rubber feet to the back and it's still a pretty darn good solution. Um, at the end of the day, I'm getting increasingly cheesed off with Polaroid and their lithium ion battery solutions because it's really something that this year I'm trying to get down and figure out the best solutions to going forwards. Because, um, and feel free, have a, have a chat in the comments below. If you've had some kind of iType camera or instant lab or film processing unit and it no longer works, the batteries have gone bad or the charging doesn't work, let me know because it's a huge issue. I'm starting to think the issue is bigger than what I actually realize. Um, and simply put at the moment, there's just no support. It's actually quite hard to get over the, um, like, like off the shelf components that fit into these things without substantial modifications. Um, as I was saying before, the original battery in this particular camera uses what they call a BMS. Um, and it's basically a little balancing system that balances the charge between these two lithium ion cells. And the only guide that I could find online reassembles these without that. And that's not exactly a safe thing to do. Um, but normally it wouldn't be such a problem because I could easily wire a new set of cells onto this original BMS, but this BMS is dead. So unless I get my loop out and find whatever part numbers are on these tiny little chips, order some and perf perform like cell phone repair grade soldering on this little PCB, 
There's no easy way to get a battery for an instant lab. And it's the same thing with other iType cameras. So hold it right there. Because in between filming all these videos, I had this thing delivered. This was a Polaroid i1, brand new in the box. My client's taken the viewfinder off so as not to lose it. This was brand new in the box, totally sealed from back when it was released, which, uh, when was that, 2015, 2016, 2017, something like that, but years ago. I think it's about six years old at least. It was in the box, completely sealed, didn't work. The reason for it, look how puffy these cells are. These have completely swollen and gone bad. And the reason for that is these cameras were likely stored at a high battery charge. And this is what happens to lithium ion batteries if you leave them stored with a charge in them. They sit there for years, they puff up, go bad. This no longer holds a charge at all. I've removed the, uh, the capped on tape off this so that I could access the components. And again, we have a little BMS. Now, I believe because these use batteries that are in a series, uh, sorry, not a series, they're, they're wired in parallel as opposed to the uh, wired in series of the Instant Lab. So the Instant Lab needs 7.4 volts. The i1 only needs 3.7. So these are wired in parallel, which is why the positive and the positive and the negative and the negative are touching. Um, this shouldn't need any kind of balance circuit protection. I should actually just be able to solder new cells directly in uh, using using the factory leads, but I could theoretically salvage these boards in order to put them back into the camera. But I wanna show you just how annoying these things are to service because it's not even like, like they make these little lithium ion pouch batteries that have leads attached to them. So you can just like this, right? So you can plug and unplug it. Um, if I find a screwdriver here, let me just show you exactly what's going on inside this thing, because I, I, I took the door off before. Here we go, let's grab a screwdriver here. The door comes off with two screws, which is nice. But look at what happens once we get inside the camera. We find the most irritating thing ever. And that is that whilst yes, there is a plug, the plug doesn't contain just the battery leads, right? It also contains the leads that go along the side and then into the camera. So to actually replace the battery cell inside the Impossible Project i1, you have to desolder the battery. So it's, it's not something that the average user is going to be able to do. So certainly this year, this is not gonna be the only set of videos you see from me where I try and tackle and find good solutions for all of these i-type cameras with rechargeable batteries. Um, because this is my sort of, my New Year's resolution in 2024 has been to figure out the best possible methods of servicing these things. Because the thing that annoys me is like, I work on classic Polaroid cameras that are like 50 years old. And you know, some of the times they don't function. A lot of the times they just need a bit of maintenance. But in some ways they're easier to repair than something that was, you know, built in the last decade that is completely functional, but has failed purely because of the power supply. And that kind of stuff, it just irritates me to no end. The fact that the design is so poor that these things after just a few years stop working completely. Anyway. At least my client, Sam, now has a functional battery back for his Mamiya, which is really cool to see. Um, I do not make adapter backs for these cameras, but you can purchase them. This one was made by Reservot, I believe. You can purchase them online. Uh, people make up 3D printed kits and heaps of different kits. I don't make these personally, but I am happy to modify them if you want something like this. Um, simply get in touch and I'll see what we can do. Anyway, uh, this video ended up being sort of impromptu. Um, it's None of this was really a repair guide or a deep dive or, or anything like that. It's just sort of my rambling thoughts on what I think is a much bigger problem that even I envisioned. Um, than even I envisioned, I should say. 
Um, and this is certainly not the first video you're going to see on this subject. So I think I'm going to leave it there for now because we do have a functional uh, adapter and this is going to go back to my client today. I'm going to ship that off to him. And uh, yeah, if you'd like to see me tackle more of this iType content with these rechargeable batteries, let me know. I promise I will be doing more content on this in the future. If there's something specific you'd like me to talk about, let me know in the comments below. Until then, you're a wonderful audience. If you'd like something prepared, feel free to get in touch and send something out my way. If you just simply like what I do, give us a like or a subscribe, or feel free to buy me a beer or two using the coffee account below. Until then, have a wonderful day, and I'll see you next time.